Așa. Hare. Ok, great. Hello and welcome everybody. Warm welcome to you. Um, there, now you can see me as well. Hello. Good to see some of you joining us today for a talk about Sweden and the Swedish approach to human rights. And I would like to, to start today by explaining that there is no, no such thing as a Swedish, uh, just a Swedish approach that all Swedish, Swedish actors use when it comes to human rights, of course. And there is, um, however, some common factors and we will talk about them today. Um, we'll wait a second to see that everyone has joined. Okay, great. And so, and also to add that uh, the approach used a lot in Sweden can also be used by many other nations that is not exclusive to, to Sweden per se. So I'm not sure what perception you have of Sweden. Maybe you've heard of H&M and Ikea and Spotify and, and many Swedish companies or some Swedish approaches to human rights. But today we will go much deeper to a country that is quite close to Ukraine and that has the same colors on the flag. So we have some things in common actually. And to introduce myself, my name is Louise Nielsen, and I am from the Center of Civil Liberties. So, and I have the pleasure to guide you in this lecture today. All right, then we can go on to the next slide here. Perfect. So this is the lecture outline, what we will go through today, today's lecture. And I will try to speak slowly and clearly um, in English, and if you have any questions regarding the language, um, you can put them in the chat and we will be happy to answer. There will also be a little break in between uh, this, where you will have a possibility to stretch out and, and write additional uh, questions, and then we will address some of the questions after that break. Um, so we will start uh, with an introduction of some of the actors in Sweden when it comes to human rights. And so, Natasha, next uh, slide, please. Right, so here we have the parliament on the left and you see the leader of the Swedish parliament, Stefan Löfven today is the prime minister and he is a leader of the party, the Social Democrats in Sweden. Uh, the parliament is called Riksdagen in Swedish and it has 349 seats. It was originally 350, but then they realized that you need a majority to be able to vote on things, so they, they removed one seat. And the seats in the parliament are proportional uh, to the different parties, and there is an election every four years. So that's the, the term for, uh, for the prime minister. So. On the right, you can see our uh, king, the King Carl Gustav the 16th. And he is the head of the royal family. Uh, and as you may know, Sweden is a monarchy. However, this does not mean that they have uh, a lot of power. Actually, the, the royal family of Sweden has more of symbolic power. And they are a non-political representative uh, of Sweden and they attend many state meetings overseas and so on. Welcome, I can see that some people are still joining, welcome. Uh, right now we're talking about state actors in Sweden and we're talking about both the parliament and we have also uh, the royal family. The royal family uh, who are uh, funded by uh, Swedish tax money as well and they do have a lot of charities and many of them, they focus on one thing that they really um, enjoy and that they put the, the charity towards. For example, the Swedish king is very concerned about the environment and he is having many 
uh, or seven charities and many initiatives connected to this. And the, the Crown Princess Victoria, she has, uh, she's working and has a charity with um, uh, people of disabilities, yeah. disabled people. So that's some introduction to the basic structure in Sweden when it comes to the rule. And then we of course also have some non-governmental actors and also organizations that are state funded and they are on the next slide. Baja, if you will change, thank you. There are some examples here and you may recognize some. Sida, for example, is a, a state and sponsored uh, organization that distributes much aid around the world. There are many of these working with different uh, topics. As you can see, there's the, the LGBTQ flag and, the, and they specialize on many things. So a lot of the work with human rights is also done through these kinds of organizations. Next slide, please. All right. We will try to go quite fast today, as I know that you have um, um, things to do and uh, that uh, we will want an efficient uh, presentation. But of course, please tell me if you need me to slow down as well. Okay, so in human rights work, there is the need for a strong foundation. And human rights, they largely begin at home and as Sweden strives to walk its talk, it is important to ensure that the values that we promote uh, abroad are upheld at home. So how does Sweden deal with human rights within Sweden? Today's human rights system in Sweden has taken centuries to develop. And in Sweden, human rights are guaranteed by three of four constitutional laws. It's the instrument of government the Freedom of the Press Act, and the Fundamental Law on Freedom of Expression. And this is quite interesting because the Freedom of Press Act it was founded in 1766. And this is actually, uh, the Swedish legislation is actually regarded as the world's first law uh, on supporting the freedom of the press and freedom of uh, information. So we've had this foundation for quite a while. The very first chapter of the instrument of government provides that public power shall be exercised to ensure universal human quality and individual freedom and dignity. And it further states that the government shall guarantee the right to work, housing, education, and promote social welfare, security, and a good living environment. And this is not very different from many other countries that have constitutional laws such as this. And uh, so therefore I will now go on to explain some areas where Sweden stick out or was the first. In the next slide. Perfect, all right. So first of all, uh, you can see uh, one example where Sweden sticks out a bit. So Sweden was the first country in the world to ban the smacking of children in 1979. And this, the main thought for this is that by smacking your children, there is a break of trust between parent and child and that this can cause problems in the future. Another area where Sweden is quite original or stick out is parental rights. Actually in Sweden, when you have a child, uh, you have the right to 480 days of parental leave. And to make this more equal, the government has decided that each uh, parent shall have 90 days each. And so this you cannot um, hand over to someone else, but if the dad, for example, choose not to use this, you will not get these days. And so the, the paid parental leave is based on the income that you had before. And, and it, um, the main thoughts behind this kind of distribution that it should be um, 90 days each 
It is for flipping the consensus and changing the norms around raising child and children and childcare. So then this provides the woman with some assistance in the beginning and also the, the possibility for a father to bond with the child early on. There's also the possibility of vabba, which means taking care of a sick child. So if your child is, is sick, you can take the day off work and you're still entitled to get paid. Um, and this has um, an equal factor to it that the, the, the dad could also do that. And I heard from um, recent times that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's parliament actually just voted in the first instance on uh, parental leave for, uh, or paternal leave more, uh, parental leave for, for the father. And so this may be on the way in Ukraine as well, which is very exciting. All right, and then um, we have LGBTQ rights in which uh, Sweden is seen as one of the most progressive countries in the world. Um, Sweden was the first country in the world to allow transgender persons to uh, change their legal gender after uh, sex reassignment surgery, and this was already in 1972. And it's also possible uh, for gay and lesbian to act as uh, clergy in the church, uh, so to be bishop or a priest, for example. And, and the government also allow partnership benefits for same-sex couples and same-sex marriage. Marriage has been and legal uh, worldwide since 2009. And in Sweden, uh, there is a lot of consensus on this topic. Actually in 2019, there was a polling um, made and they asked people what they think about LGBTQ rights. And 98% of Sweden's population believe that gay and bisexual people should enjoy the same rights as heterosexual people. And 92%, a very high percentage, uh, supported um, same-sex marriage. So this is uh, a very common belief in Sweden that they should have equal rights. And it is also possible um, for same-sex couples to do, or lesbians, for example, to do IVF or uh, assisted insemination to get a child. So this is something in Sweden we have. All right, we can move on. Next slide. Um, perfect. So uh, it is, uh, it is, however, um, in Sweden there are some challenges, of course, as in any country. So you might think that there are um, that there is nothing uh, that we struggle with, but for sure there has been controversy when it comes to human rights. So some of the challenges that we see are um, the government's approach to Sami people. So there's been long sta standing conflict um, between government and big industry uh, to conduct mining on Sami land. And to explain to you, the Sami is an indigenous peoples in Sweden. And Sweden has five official minorities which includes Jews, Roma, the Tornidalians, Swedish Finns, and then the indigenous Sami. We also have a lot of controversy when it comes to the topic of weapon exports. Sweden has been one of the largest um, and top 10 largest exporters of weapons. And this is mainly aircrafts and made by the company Saab in Sweden. And this is controversial for Sweden because of its reputation as a humanitarian nation. And uh, Sweden is a signatory of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which is a landmark international treaty that has the objective to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapon technology and promote cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy um, 
and to further the goal of achieving nuclear disarmament uh, around the globe. So the Swedish government has um, been challenged by this and recently voted through that Sweden should not sell weapons to non-democratic nations. However, there has been um, uh, weapon sales that have been controversial, and this is a topic that is constantly uh, on, the, on the debate in Sweden. Who is democratic, who is not? It's a hard line to draw. And then we also have problems with segregation, actually. And Sweden has had um, high, um, relatively high immigration, um, usually, as we want to help people that flee from war and uh, have um, said that we should be a, a welcoming nation. Um, so uh, the Swedish government has still struggled with the fact that uh, we should integrate people into society. And so we have seen an increase in segregation lately, and this is both ethnical and socioeconomic. So that are some challenges that Sweden has. And also, even though Sweden is seen as one of the most gender equal countries in the world, we have never had a, a, a woman, a female, uh, prime Minister, and we have never had a queen that is the head of the royal family since it has been a um, patriarchal secession of the royal family. However, this may soon change as the next person in line to the throne in Sweden is the Crown Princess Victoria. Okay, then we will move on to the next slide and we will talk about some Swedish human rights heroes. And to explain to you, these are some uh, heroes that are uh, very uh, personal to me and many um, Swedish people as well are very uh, proud of these uh, people and their accomplishments. So for example, when I grew up, I really was admired Admiring, and I still am and admiring uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. So Dag Hammarskjöld uh, was the second UN Secretary General, and he was actually the youngest person to ever be Secretary General of the United Nations. He worked with the decolonization of Africa, and especially a lot in the, in Congo. And unfortunately, his term as his second term as secretary general was cut short when his plane was shot down and he died in the plane crash um, in 1960. Um, so this um, was uh, a catastrophe for the United Nations as they did not have uh, a plan for such, um, such an uh, action and uh, they had to vote on the successor after Dag Hammarskjöld. And it is uh, still remaining some question marks about his death. And the CIA, the year after the plane was shot down, uh, blamed the KGB for uh, the shooting down of the plane. Um, however, this has not been um, confirmed. And um, Dag Hammarskjöld is actually the first person and the, per the only person ever uh, to be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize uh, posthumously, so after his death. In, uh, in the middle there, on the left, you can see uh, Alva Myrdal, which is an inspiring woman uh, who was a diplomat and a politician in Sweden. And she was a prominent leader of the disarmament, disarmament movement during the Cold War, and she was uh, appointed uh, into uh, the United Nations as a Swedish delegate. And uh, she was the first um, woman to hold such a prominent position as a chairman uh, of the UNESCO social science uh, section. And uh, she also received a Nobel Peace Prize and uh, she has, she received that in 1982. 
And Alva Myrdal was also a very important figure for Sweden internally because she was a leading uh, factor into the uh, about the educational system so that she reformed education in Sweden and education in Sweden is today completely tax funded uh, with um, it is free and there are also uh, lunches in school. So she thought that it um, doesn't matter if you're poor or if you're rich, you should be able to have a good education. And um, I'm happy for that today because I have been able to enjoy such a good education. We have also Raoul Wallenberg there on the picture. And Raoul Wallenberg, you might know he was a diplomat and a humanitarian, and he saved tens of thousands of Jews in German-occupied Hungary during the Second World War. And the way he did this was in part by renting buildings in Budapest and declaring them uh, as Swedish uh, territory. And he put up signs on these buildings saying Swedish library or um, a Swedish uh, uh, embassy, something like this. And inside, um, they were hiding Jews inside these buildings. He would also provide documents to uh, Jewish people in uh, Hungary. And on these documents was his signature. And uh, he, they were saying that these people were uh, Swedish uh, or applying to become Swedish and should therefore not be um, sent to concentration camps and so on. So for this, he has been uh, very celebrated after. Uh, he's received many awards. And uh, this has maybe also been posthumously since Raoul Wallenberg disappeared or he was, he was arrested and then disappeared in 1945. As um, later reported by uh, the uh, KGB, uh, he had died in uh, 1947 at the headquarters of the KGB secret police in Moscow. And uh, the motives behind Wallenberg's arrest and imprisonment by the Soviet government uh, along with questions surrounding the circumstances of his death, still to the, this day remain uh, a mystery. And there is continued speculation on this and some uh, investigations still, uh, still going on. And to the right is probably uh, it's an, a new addition to our Swedish human rights heroes, Greta Thunberg, which you might have heard about. Uh, she was awarded the Times Person of the Year, and is a climate activist who started Fridays for Future and climate movement where children protest um, for, the, for the future of the planet and the environment. So uh, in Sweden, all these, uh, these first three people at least, have um, institutions, uh, statues and streets named after them. And I would not be surprised if if Greta Thunberg would have the same in the future. Okay, and then we will go on to our last slide before taking a shorter break. Okay, so Sweden in the world. Now I've talked about Sweden uh, inside Sweden's borders, but it's also interesting to look at how the nation acts in accordance to, in relation to other countries. And so um, Sweden's work um, is also guided by international conventions, frameworks, and the EU a lot, and uh, national laws and goals, of course. Sweden has focused on building bridges between countries a lot, and has one of the highest uh, per capita aid distribution in the world. This has led to the fact that Sweden this year was pronounced to be the goodest country. I'm not sure if that is the word, but the, the, the goodest country in the world by the Good Country Index, uh, which calculates uh, 
36 different um, categories to determine who is contributing the most to, um, to the planet outside its own borders. And so um, the index shows that relative to its size, um, Sweden takes the top position this year. It's the second time it does so. And this rank is from 149 countries. And so uh, it's, it's based on, um, we were highest in health and, uh, and very high in environment on this list to contributing, but it is uh, a lot due to um, the aid that Sweden sent to many countries. And this is the approach that Sweden has because it realizes that no country stands alone in the quest for human rights and that we are all connected and interconnected through economy, through uh, politics in every area. And what is happening overseas can affect uh, your own country and the peoples inside it. So it's very important not to only focus on the human rights uh, within the nation's borders, but to uh, help and uh, aid these countries financially. We have also uh, realized that it is usually best to assist these countries instead of taking over and telling countries how to act and, and how to implement human rights, uh, to provide tools instead and guidelines, but mostly to, to learn with the countries and to grow together in a partnership. Okay, so that is um, it. Now we will have a shorter break and feel free to ask any questions in the chat. And let me know if you have um, any comments that you want to have. Um, implemented if you want me to speak uh, different or if you can understand it's great okay let's have a break let's stretch out because uh, we all need to stretch and uh, we'll see you soon in five minutes we will be back here and friends if you uh, have some questions you can um tell it by voice or uh, send in chat and we have some uh, questions uh, from our uh, pre-register form and I'll send you, uh, it to you in our chat and maybe okay. you can answer okay. for all our students or like this. Definitely. I will look at that uh, during the break and so I will see you in five minutes. Great. So welcome back. Um, now we will go through the questions here. So uh, I will read them and then I will try to uh, give an answer as honestly as possible. So the first question is where for Swedes uh, there is a line between political correctness, fear of looking rude, criticizing or condemning other people and sincerity in communication, the need to say what you really think about the person. Um, do not social restrictions restrict a person's freedom of expression uh, to an openly unpleasant assessment of his or own, her own actions? Okay, so this is a very interesting question. Thank you for that. It is regarding, uh, to summarize, if there is um, so much political correctness in Sweden that it gets in the way and starts to mute people to actually say what they want and what they feel. And this is important um, because if uh, people are not allowed to express their opinions, sometimes they can go underground and uh, they can grow even stronger. So uh, there is definitely political correctness in Sweden. I think the higher you go in level, in uh, authoritarian level, for example, the higher the political correctness pressure is. 
Um, but there is um, also on a local level uh, some things that you just do not say uh, that uh, are considered to be extremely rude. And there is a balance to be found here. I think the, uh, the main approach would be you should be respectful and you should uh, not use hate speech, of course. Um, the law of hate speech is drawn at, for example, a hate speech would be if you incite violence against a group of people uh, or uh, and also something that is very uh, important to keep track of is misinformation. And that can be very harmful if um, thrown out there without any responsibility. Uh, so the approach would be, you should be respectful uh, about other people uh, when you speak and realize the impact that you do have because each person has power. With that said, I do think that there needs to be more honest conversations going on. And instead of attacking people to listen to the, the opinion and really and dig at what the problem may be underneath, to de-escalate conversations, uh, which uh, is important because usually when you are angry at some, something and the situation is very tense, then there is a possibility uh, for hate speech or uh, more extreme uh, language. So if you can get to the root of people uh, and the root of the conversation and the problem, then there's a possibility to solve it. So first of all, to take deep, deep breaths, to try to express what is underneath this anger, for example, that exists and to try to solve it would be uh, a really good a way to start because usually when you use um, politically incorrect language it's because uh, there is some frustration there so I think de-escalation uh, would be very important but of course um, I am I would not say that cancel culture or this kind of shunning of people that don't have your opinion is something positive so there's a really interesting balance there and I could write an essay, an essay about this topic, so I will not. I will go on to uh, another question. So one would be, how can human rights be addressed in early education? How is it done in Swedish schools? Well, there is a lack of this for sure. Uh, there are some schools in Sweden which are UN certified, which means that they are UN schools and in school, the teachers will provide some education on basic human rights and so on. It's usually a bit implemented into the, um, the curriculum, the, the school uh, agenda for the students, uh, but uh, really not enough. And I think that this is a topic that should be um, expanded to implement um, an, a basic understanding of what human rights is. There's also a question of, are there many feminist groups in Sweden and what are they? Are they mostly student groups? Well, feminism is quite big in Sweden and we have it on many levels. There is a political party that is called FU, which is the, stands for Feminist Initiative. And uh, it is right on the, the level to be included into parliament. It's not received enough votes yet, but it's, uh, it does exist uh, you know, as a political party, but there are, uh, of course, student groups and uh, I would say local uh, groups to join. And such groups are very, uh, very important just because you are a feminist and believe in the equality of the sexes does not mean that you agree on, on all of the topics within that conversation. So that is very important to have these groups to create such conversation. Thank you for that question. Um, there's another one, it's not really a question, it's more of a, uh, an ask. It says, tell me something about the right of Swedish citizens and non-citizens to meet their housing needs. Well, 
as I said before, it's in the fundamental law of Sweden that the government shall provide housing for its nationals. However, and this is also something that is debated as prices are quite high. And in Sweden, um, it is quite cold and housing is therefore very uh, vital. And we do have, uh, for example, refugee homes and shelters for those who need it. There are very seldom homeless people in Sweden. It does not often happen, but sometimes students feel like that they have to live with their parents for too long to save up. And it's quite hard to own an apartment in Sweden. Most people rent an apartment. Um, and this is also um, interesting because Sweden is one of the countries where most people live alone, quite uh, individualistic. And um, that's obviously more expensive because you're, uh, you're not sharing the rent with someone else. So this is something that uh, that's for sure uh, should be more addressed to have cheaper accommodation. And it's something that the government is working on every year. Well, we have even more questions. Okay, I'm so happy that you're very involved. And um, let's see what this question is. So it says, um, what ways uh, to support human rights defenders by public authorities? Wow, this is a huge one. Um, well, uh, public authorities are semi-involved in, uh, in human rights organizations, but there are, um, there are many ways to, for example, apply for aid. So this is something that the main way that public authorities help human rights defenders is by providing aid. And this goes both to organizations, but also to uh, projects and individuals, um, for sure. The influence of human rights organizations on the elimination of violence at a state level. What methods are used to correct human rights violations? Okay, so many different methods. Uh, there are, for example, legal methods, um, elimination of violence. If we take, for example, violence against women and, and rape, Sweden usually um, uh, is uh, seen as quite progressive on this, uh, this topic. And recently we passed a law that says that in Sweden, um, it is considered a rape if there is no consent in sex. And so you do not have to prove that there was violence or force, but you just have to prove that there was not consent uh, to sex in order to show that it was rape. This um, is highly normative. It does not change the, the legal proceeding as much as one may hope because the prosecutors still have to prove that there was a crime that was committed, of course. Uh, but it does change the conversa conversation and it does show also that Sweden takes seriously um, the norms and it's a, it's a big statement to say that uh, if you don't get verbal or physical um, consent that, that it is considered rape. So for example, uh, making such a, a legislative statement would be one of the methods uh, that's used to eliminate violence. Um, all right, uh, I will answer the, the last uh, question that I can see quite fast. Uh, so it says, uh, can you please say, are there any issues now in Sweden regarding the human rights and COVID pandemics? Your country has not imposed the lockdown as most others that uh, would save the economy, uh, but there's still uh, challenges for human rights organizations, medical institution workers, etc." Great question, very relevant. So um, yes, Sweden has been quite controversial in their approach to the COVID pandemic in that we have not imposed many reg regulations um, in the country. For example, masks have not been um, mandatory and are seldom used. And um, we've recently received quite a lot of critique for this. Uh, 
And it may be said that regarding human rights that people have a right to safety and a right to life. And in some cases have not been protected enough. For example, the virus have gotten into many old people care houses. And while it is a beautiful thing that Sweden has old people care houses where old people are collected and taken care of, it also means that if there is a virus, everyone there is in the risk zone. And unfortunately, many of the deaths had been from this. So a lot of older people have died. And while they are old, they, of course, still have their human rights. So this is a critique that Sweden has received, that there's been a lack of protection. There's also been um, some critique that we have not acted fast enough uh, when it comes to, for example, medical workers to have access to uh, enough uh, protections in their, in their work and having to work too much. With that said, Sweden has, uh, the Swedish government has um, introduced uh, aid programs to assist um, um, both workers and, and the regions in how they handle this pandemic. And there has been, so there has been some financial support um, recently as well. And they have changed that uh, you do not, now you can, uh, uh, I'm not sure I have to translate that, but now you can stay home uh, if you feel sick from your job uh, without having to lose pay. So they changed that in the, in the legislation that you can, you can be home um, as soon as you feel a little bit sick. So it's really been um, an approach that has relied a lot about public trust and public trust in government in Sweden is quite high and vice versa. So the government has trusted people, uh, individuals, to take their own responsibility to not go out if they are sick. And it's too early to see how this will play out, but um, it will be interesting for sure to see. Okay, thank you for your questions. Then we, we, had, we had a hand from Roman Hromek, I see. Roman? Okay, do you want to um, unmute and, uh, and put your question? Sure. Good morning, Luis. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And I apologize for not displaying myself. Uh, but you can hear me, so that should be good enough. Yes, then I can see a picture. Uh, yes. Uh, my question relates to something I have uh, heard about Sweden some years ago, and I never had the time to really research on that and to check if it's uh, having any ground behind it. Uh, it related to the unreported uh, domestic violence cases. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like any other country, Sweden has a certain percentage of domestic violence cases that are not reported by the victims for different reasons. And the specific thing that I heard about Sweden is that uh, victims of domestic violence oftentimes are aware of the fact that uh, Sweden is supposed to be like the champion of human rights and champion of protecting people. Mm -hmm. And when uh, this happens to them, they feel ashamed of uh, reporting it uh, because, well, how can it happen to me in such a country where it shouldn't be happening at all. And so they, they fail to report it even to the law enforcement because then they risk that maybe their friends will know about it and, and yeah. they should rather keep it to themselves. Have you heard about that? Is it actually a thing? And, and how common is that of a reason for people not to report domestic violence? Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a great question. It's also quite hard to answer because like you say, Luman, that many of these cases are in the dark, we do not know how many are um, um, subject to this violence since they do not report. Um, what I will say is that there are some services for those who have domestic violence within their home and that they can call. And of course that the legal system is there to, to provide help. Uh, but uh, of course, with that said, just because Sweden has a good um, foundation for human rights and that it's um, seen as this uh, example, it does not mean that human rights violations does not happen, of course. And it is uh, very important to say that the work is, is still uh, uh, very much ongoing. Sweden is not homogeneous in its population. Uh, 
everyone does not uh, think the same or act according to this, um, these regulations. And uh, of course, such violations do take place, unfortunately. It is not um, seen as very common uh, because the norm is very strongly against it since we do have such a focus on gender equality and so on. Uh, but with that said, uh, there has been, um, there is still segregation in, in the community, which means that uh, more or less people feel uh, a connection uh, to, to really trust government as well. Um, but I would say uh, that if something like this happens uh, to of course uh, reach out and that there is, that there is help to find. That's the, that's the short answer I can give you. Uh, but, uh, Thank you. Yes, for sure. Okay, Daja, if we share the, the slides then, do you have them? Close the shot to me, we will see. Dasha, are you there? Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so we're talking about Sweden in the world. And uh, with this, we also should mention the Nobel Prize, of course. And um, Sweden uh, has. Uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and the Nobel Prizes um, since uh, in the memory of Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite. And uh, it's uh, just this week and last week uh, in the middle of the, the Nobel Peace, uh, <laughs> Nobel Prize ceremony of this year. Uh, so this is something that Sweden is known for in the world as well. It is the Swedish Academy that awards um, the Nobel Prizes. All right, and then we will talk about also, of course, uh, Sweden in the world, we have to talk about a, a feminist foreign policy that Sweden in 2014 uh, was the first country in the world uh, to have. Uh, so Sweden uh, has this uh, feminist foreign policy and you might think, well, what does a feminist foreign policy mean? And so it means uh, that you are applying a systematic gender equality perspective uh, throughout the whole foreign policy agenda. It does not only focus on one topic, but it's, it should cover all of the factions of the foreign policy. Um, Sweden also has an, an active network of uh, women peace mediators and to be deployed into conflicts around the world, uh, operating with the Nordic network. And it has been proved um, analysis of 40 peace processes since the Cold War uh, in cases where women are able to exercise a strong influence uh, in peace processes, that there was a much higher chance of an agreement and uh, that an agreement will last uh, if a woman was uh, or women groups uh, was a part of the agreement uh, and exercised influence than if they uh, were not a part of such a uh, procedure. And so uh, feminist foreign policy, it um, recognizes that norms play a big role in relation to gender equality and the possibility for women and girls to fully enjoy human rights. Therefore, it needs to deal with stereotypical norms. And as norms, they often lie deep within us and there's a need to work in many different ways. And here is some examples for how you could do it. So in your work, you can highlight gender equality as a goal itself, uh, but also as a prerequisite for achieving other goals like social and economic development. You can also use arguments that are built on facts, research and examples, and forge partnerships uh, with more and uh, new actors in terms of the possibility to reach new groups. You can also use communication and campaigns in a strategic way, uh, linking broad messages to local context. 
and identify common challenges. So this informed policy has been huge in order to work with other countries instead of um, telling other people what to do to identify common challenges that both countries struggle with. Um, for example, men's violence um, against women, like we discussed before, and differences in pay, etc., and how gender equality can be part of uh, the solutions. And the main uh, strategy of the foreign policy is uh, the feminist foreign policies, dialogue. And dialogue is to talk, talk to, to distinguish what are the pro problems, what are the solutions, and then create real and lasting work. And in the next slide, we will see we have we have uh, the three uh, or sorry the four R's that guide the feminist foreign policy, and of course it all begins and ends with reality inside here. And so uh, the policy is based on facts and statistics about girls and women's everyday lives and produces results uh, in people's lives. If it's if it's not having effect, it loses its relevance. So this means that the perspective is working um, uh, based on um, reality in the context at hand and is structured according to the three other R's. And they are the rights, the representation, and the resources. So how do we use this model in the work? For example, if we pose the question, what does in reality it mean um, or what does the reality uh, capture by statistics say about the difference between men and women and girls and boys then we look at do we have the same rights do education work marriage divorce inheritance for example we also look at are women and girls represented in um, all of these different um, levels in parliaments, in boards, in legal systems, is the representation. We further look at is gender equality taken into consideration when it's uh, in account to how resource and uh, resources are allocated. So in central government budgets and development projects, um, is gender taken into account? It means that you gender mainstream in everything um, that you do. The analysis also have to go deeper and take into account the concept of intersectionality uh, to see that people, um, it's, it's not so black and white that there's 43% women in this representation, but um, take into account also living uh, conditions, levels of influence and, uh, and needs uh, of these people. So intersectionality is very important for such a plan to work. So the feminist foreign policy goes out from this model, but it also works from a yearly action plan that the government uh, provides. So, um, that is the Swedish approach uh, for international rights-based uh, solidarity. And um, Sweden is one of the few countries to contribute as immensely and actively and effectively uh, to human rights-based international solidarity. And I hope that um, it comes through that it is important um, that we understand each other's nations uh, in order to grow together because we really are uh, all connected. So with that, um, I would like to continue to the last slide, I believe. Let's see if I might. Jasha, last slide, please. Thank you, yes, great. Uh, all right, so I want to also show you uh, some resources uh, to sum up and uh, to continue your work and uh, some resources you can use for your human rights work. Um, it's, it includes the Good Country Index. You can check it out. You can see um, how is this measured? What does a country um, do in, in order to uh, further human rights around the world? They look at 
and many different indicators, rights, um, and the health environment, uh, quality, all these different indicators um, to see which countries are contributing, which are lagging behind. And this is interesting to understand, um, um, to have a more global perspective, really, of the initiatives that are taking place. So you can check that out, the Good Country Index. Uh, you can also go to uh, the Uppsala Data Conflict Program. This is something we use a lot in international relations when we try to understand what conflicts are happening now around the world. What wars are going on? Which are the actors? So there is actor analysis and it will show you an overall picture of our planet. This is a good resource to conduct some monitoring and understanding uh, behind your research. I will also tell you about the Natalia pro the project, which was uh, introduced by the, the civil uh, for rights, um, uh, civil center for, for rights. And so the Natalia project uh, is a project where uh, human rights defenders uh, are protected through um, kind of a bracelet uh, that is uh, very indestructible. Uh, you put it on and if, uh, uh, if you are attacked as a human rights defender, you can press this kind of alarm button and a signal will be sent to this uh, center and they will, um, they will then uh, validify uh, the alarm and they will send send out to um, a broad number of actors, uh, journalists, etc., people in the area uh, to explain that you as a human rights defender have been attacked, for example. Um, so this is provided to human rights defenders who are uh, being prosecuted and it's uh, active on 100, I believe 170 people have this so far. And um, it's a kind of protection service. So you can read more about that on the website. And then finally, I will tell you about the free human rights based approach training uh, from the Swedish International Center for Local Democracy. And uh, this is free to register, I believe, until the 20th or 21st of December. And uh, you need to be from a certain number of countries to qualify for this training. And Ukraine is uh, one of these countries. So this is a resource that is provided to you. And I hope that this helps you in your human rights work. And I thank everyone that took the time out today to take part of this lecture. And I wish you a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Luis. Bye.